Hello and welcome back to our course Internet Marketing Brands and Consumers. My name is Veronika Tarnovskaya and I am the responsible professor in this course. Our topic for today is branding on the Internet and we are going to address this topic from the theoretical perspective using several articles from our course literature. The key question that we are trying to answer today is how relevant is the traditional thinking about brands for the phenomena of digital branding. Today, the topic of our lecture is branding on the Internet. We will take the theoretical perspective of the Internet branding phenomenon and use some articles from the course literature to support these approaches. The key learning objectives are to define brands and branding, revise the major postulates of traditional brand management, and after that, question the relevance of the traditional thinking for the Web to Zero environment. We will also briefly mention some recent consumer trends that have influenced our general attitude to brands. At the end, we will try to make sense of the online branding by outlining three different approaches from the course literature. The specific references to the course literature will appear on some slides in order to provide you with key points from these articles. I will start from providing the definition of a brand by American Marketing Association. Many of you are familiar with this definition, since it is broadly used in the mainstream marketing and branding literature. The second definition by Leslie de Cernatoni and Malcolm McDonald also belongs to the mainstream branding paradigm. There is a reason why I'm using this particular definition. First, it clearly distinguishes a brand as such from branding process. As follows, it is important to distinguish a brand as an identifiable product or service from the way it is communicated and perceived. Very often, brand and branding are used interchangeably, and such concepts as brand promise, brand relationship, brand associations, brand cultures are used as similar to brands. However, those are the derivatives from what the brand is an identifiable product or service and belong to communication sphere or the perception sphere. In this way, we can talk about branding as perception or impression management. But the brand is just a symbol that anchors these impressions to the product or service the company has designed to satisfy a particular customer need. We can now look at the major postulates of the traditional brand management that you all are most familiar with. It is important to refresh those in order to see which of them hold and which do not hold anymore. Brands are broadly considered the key assets of the company, which generate long-term equity in the form of consumer awareness, understanding, interest, trust, trial, and finally loyalty. The importance of brands as companies' key assets is recognized by both academics and practitioners. Brands are supposed to have a clear and strong identity, which is their answer to the question, who I am and what do I stand for? Managers are advised to infuse their brands with clear and unique identities, and this is considered vital for the brand's long-term success. Without a clear identity, a brand is like a ship without a rudder. Brand identity needs to be communicated effectively and consistently with its promise to customers, and this process is executed and controlled by managers. Consumers are viewed as rather passive receivers of brand messages, and the goal of managers is to influence consumer perceptions in a way that is most favorable for the brand, which is a creation of consumer loyalty to the brand. The question is, how relevant is this way of thinking? In other words, the mainstream brand management way of thinking to brands that are active in the Web to Zero environment. In order to answer this question, we will first take a brief look at the major consumer trends which constitute the new context for both offline 
and online brands. Among these trends is the increasing surge of personal expression and individualization that is empowered by the Internet, which is mainly seen in a way consumers express themselves through products and brands they buy. Another powerful trend is the increasing concern for personal health and wellness. Consumers across different economic groups pay more and more attention to the food they put in their bodies and the product they put on their bodies. This trend is empowered by the increasing concern about the environment, for example, via consumer interest in recycling and environmentally friendly packages. Although consumers are not willing to pay any price for environmentally friendly products, they, they expect more products to follow this path. Being green has become a hygiene factor in some categories, for example, the energy-saving lamps and hybrid cars. Consumers also want to feel good about their possessions. They want peace of mind, knowing that any pleasure they derive from owning a product doesn't come at the expense of the people who made it. These trends have evolved into two different standpoints towards brands. On one hand, we experience growing anti-branding sentiments as brands are accused of many misdeeds. On the other hand, there is an increased engagement in brands. The anti-branding sentiments are seen in the growth of anti-branding sites that ridicule the most recognized and powerful brands. One example, Walmart, has been subject to criticism by various groups and individuals. Among these are some labor unions, community groups, grassroots organizations, religious organizations, environmental groups, and of course Walmart customers. They have protested against the company's policies and business practices. Other areas of criticism include the corporation's foreign product sourcing, treatment of product suppliers, environmental practices, the use of public subsidies, and the company's security policies. Walmart denies doing anything wrong and maintains that low prices are the result of, this, of its efficiency. On this picture, you can see Walmart's former CEO, Lee Scott. There has been a stream of anti-branding documentaries. In one of them, Super Size Me, the journalist Morgan Sparlock dined at McDonald's restaurants three times per day during the filming, sampling every item on the chain's menu at least once. As a result of this experiment, the 30 years old Sparlock gained 11 kilograms, a 13% body mass increase, and experienced mood swings, sexual dysfunction, and at the end, liver damage. It took Sparlock 14 months to lose the weight he gained. In another documentary, Big Boys Gone Bananas, the Swedish filmmaker Fredrik Gertens tells his story of how long a big corporation is willing to go to protect his brand. His previous film, Bananas, recounted the lawsuit that 12 Nicaraguan plantation workers brought against the fruit giant Dole Food Company. The film was selected for competition by the Los Angeles Film Festival. But then Gerton gets a strange message. The festival removes bananas from competition. Then a critical article appears in Los Angeles Business Journal about the film. And Gerton subsequently receives a letter from Dole's attorney threatening him with legal action. What follows is an unparalleled thriller that Gerton captured entirely, from Dole attacking the producers with a threat of lawsuit and bullying scare tactics to media control and PR spin. On the other hand, as we have mentioned earlier, consumers are getting more and more engaged in brands, sometimes on a deeply personal level. One example is the episode of Gap rebranding. The gap rebranding attempt was approximately one week long, starting on October 6, 
2010, when the company silently published its new logo on the left, on its website, and ending on October 12, when Gap announced the return to the old one on the right. As unremarkable as it sounds, the logo operation involved an astonishing spectrum of feelings by the internet community. More than 10,000 highly emotional customer com comments and complaints appeared on Gap's Facebook page. The result of the week-long conflict about Gap's new logo was the company's retreat, publicly labeled as the company's defeat and the community's victory. Given the substantial increase of consumer involvement in brands, the branding experts have started questioning the relevance of the traditional approach to brands and branding. As seen from this quote from one of the articles in the reading list, traditional branding was by large the exercise of a narcissist, the brand manager, who was preoccupied with creating a specific image for the brand, primarily through corporate communications, shouting how wonderful the brand is and passing on the desired image to consumers. Thus, the traditional approach is associated with the one-way communication and image fixation by managers, as well as customers' passive role in the ways their perceptions are formed. We will now look at three approaches, which according to the literature are best suited to branding in the internet environment. The first approach is called here Back to Basics. As argued in this article by Barweis and Micha, social media makes it even more urgent and companies get their basics right by developing and reliably delivering on a compelling brand promise to customers. The main reason why these authors suggest to go to basics is their belief that internet as such and social media in particular, is just a new type of environment in which brands now operate, and that managers should not be distracted by trying to keep the pace with social media development and lose sight of their fundamentals. These fundamentals are offering a clear and relevant brand promise, building consumer trust by delivering on that promise, driving the market by continually imp improving the promise and seeking further advantage by innovating beyond the familiar. These fundamentals sound simple, but many companies still fail to get them right. The authors of this article fully acknowledge the change in consumer involvement in brands due to the internet, and they call companies to be where their customers are, on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms, and use this new media for deep and real-time customer insights. Companies can and do sell things via social media, but their real value is in learning about customers. Another advice is to go viral but protect the brand. That means being cautious in what kind of information appears online and when it appears. The viral presence should be timely and authentic and in sync with the brand promise. Just consider the blend tech. Will it blend video viewed 100 million times and product sales increased 700% as an authentic example? It is important to engage fully in the social media conversations as an authentic brand, but also follow the rules. The brand should be accepted by the internet community. It should not force it. It should be relevant for what is being discussed. Another approach that is opposite to the first one is open source branding, as discussed by Susan Fournier and Jill Avery in their article, Unwanted Brand. These authors outline four major features of the new landscape. The age of social collective. People are connected to an extent never seen before, and it is not necessarily linked to brands. But Web 2.0 
fosters the sense of community. Brands can act as social glue, connecting consumers to each other. The age of transparency. Everything that can be exposed will be exposed by internet. Brands have no other choice than a full disclosure and proactive position in that regard. Not every company is comfortable with the total transparency. The age of criticism. Online consumers have become ardent brand arbiters and commentators, as the Gap case shows us. We have become more critical due to the information we have and the presence of tools to express our opinion. The age of parody and humiliation. Brand parodies have always existed, but now they are flourishing. When companies misbehave, parodies can turn into humiliation, and the strongest brands are also the most parodied ones. Among key advices that these authors give to brand managers are the following. The path of least resistance, which means ceding control to consumers, admitting to consumers that they win. Brands start listening to consumers and adapt to their demands. Playing their game, which means seeking to gain popularity by being where the action is and fitting in. Leveraging Web 2.0 interconnectedness. Enticing consumers to play the brand's game and trying to tip the power scale back to marketers. On the whole, the brand management as we knew it has ceased to exist, according to these authors. It has become more like risk management. As a result of open source branding, the long-term brand management will turn into short-term risk management. What are the characteristics of the short-term brands? They are embedded in a cultural conversation between consumers and marketers. They are culturally resonant, meaning that what is popular today will be obsolete tomorrow. They have fleeing sets of values, which is very different from what traditional brand management argues for, value consistency. Embedded in the cultural streams, brands become the collaborative, socially linked phenomena in which all stakeholders participate on the same terms. The third approach, which lies somewhere in between the first two, is performing brands. In this article by Singh and Sonnerboy, which is called Brand Performances in Social Media, the authors use the metaphor of improvisation theater to show that in social media, brand owners co-create brand performances in collaboration with the customers. The brand performance is made up of a stage, setting, a director, the actors, and audience. For brands in social media, the stage corresponds to the internet, while the setting is the chosen media, for example, a blog. A brand is the star of the performance, and it needs a good story to tell its audiences. The main characters are the audiences. They can be consumers, but also brand managers themselves. Their roles can also change. For example, consumers can act as managers and vice versa. The role of brand manager is to come up with the basic script and interrelated stories. The script provides the guidelines to the storyline and sets up the implied purpose of the story, but also moves the audience into co-creating the performance. The role of manager is to create a tension through some conflict, paradox, or twist that dramatically upsets the balance of ideas, providing the motive for participants to participate in the brand narrative. The manager will also have to navigate the story so that it doesn't develop in a completely wrong direction. Finally, due to many ways in which the participants can react to the intended story 
and what they add to it, the outcome becomes quite unpredictable. This is why the process becomes more important than the result. This change of focus gives the manager the necessary flexibility to adapt the course of action and respond to the participant's input. This is the way managers can cope with the new environment. They can and should take responsibility for the basic parameters, such as script and tension. Managers should also navigate the brand story improvisation process by acting as good storytellers and at the same time by being good listeners. A very good example of the performing brand is Dove campaign for the real beauty, originated in 2002 and performed between 2002 and 2006 with a big success. You can read about this case in the article Brand Performances in Social Media, as well as Google Dove Real Beauty Campaign and watch the multiple videos on the YouTube. Among these videos are a few made by the company and many thousands made by consumers who actively participated in the campaign both as supporters but also as critics. And the final question to you after listening to this video and reading the articles, which of these three approaches will you be willing to take for your blog brand and why? Please formulate clear arguments for the approach you have decided to take and explain why you think your approach will work. <music>